you all for the opportunity to present. Um, I know these are challenging times for everyone, but I think um, it, it's really helping to kind of expand our, our educational possibilities so that, you know, we can do more remote things like this and not be so reliant on in-person in collaboration and teaching. So, so I think it's really wonderful to be able to contribute to the colleagues um, a world away, really, 12 hours away. Um, what I hope to cover today is, is a comprehensive uh, instruction on ankle ultrasound uh, and to demonstrate some pathologies as we do that. Um, the foot and ankle are superficial structures and so are really amenable to, to the use of ultrasound um, in evaluation. <clears throat> because of their superficial nature, you're going to use a high frequency linear probe um, and, and given the bony contours and sharp contours of, of tendinous anatomy, um, often your small foot footprint linear array transducer will be your go-to. And so um, something like a hockey stick transducer or a small footprint will allow you to get in the nooks and crannies of a foot and ankle to, to uh, maintain visualization of your intended structure. Um, the anterior ankle is evaluated with the patient seated or supine and, and the anterior ankle facing upward. Uh, the main muscular tendinous and ligamentous and nervous structures in the anterior ankle are the extensor tendons uh, and the tibialis anterior, your uh, deep fibular nerve and your superficial perineal nerve, and then your ligamentous anatomy, your uh, anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. The anterior ankle joint is formed by the articular surfaces of the Taylor dome, which is indicated to the left of this image, and sorry, uh, to the right. The, the Taylor dome indicated on the right of this image with, with its hypoechoic articular cartilage. Sorry, we just skipped. It's hypoechoic articular cartilage demonstrated by the arrows, um, the distal tibia, and the tibial plafond on the left, and then the anterior capsule indicated by the stars superficially. And between that, we have an intervening fat pad and synovium. And that can be assessed dynamically with ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And so as we do that, we see that the talus articulates with the tibia and the fat pad and synovium become more distinct. Pathologically, um, a hypoechoic distension of the anterior capsule can represent a fusion, uh, or in this case, a synovitis. And loose bodies can also be deposited in the anterior joint recess uh, indicated in this image with hyperechoic multifocal uh, punctate um, structures uh, indicative of a cartilaginous or bony loose body. The main ligamentous stabilizer that's visualized in the anterior ankle is the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which courses from the lateral tibia to the medial fibula, and it stabilizes the ankle against dorsiflexion inversion stresses and bridges from the, the, the distal tibia over to fibula. And it has a rather oblique course. So in a straight axial plane, this may not be visualized well. And so this requires a rotation of the probe. Uh, one means in which can be by anchoring the probe on the distal fibula, often over the anterior talofibular ligament, which can be more easily visualized. And then rotating the medial end of the probe or anterior end of the probe upward so that the talus falls off but the tibia arises. So in this image, we have fibula to the left, talus to the right, and the laminar appearing hyperechoic structures bridging across those is your AITFL. <clears throat> that can also be stressed, same as with your physical examination maneuvers. So a dorsiflexion inversion moment at the ankle will stress those AITFL fibers, uh, confirming that they're intact or perhaps lax and pathologic. Anterior tibialis is the largest tendon in the anterior ankle. Um, it's held down by a superior retinaculum. Um, it courses across the anterior medial leg adjacent to tibia and becomes a large hyperechoic ovoid looking tendon in the anterior leg adjacent to the medial tibia. Uh, as it courses over the anterior ankle joint, it, it maintains that densely hyperechoic ovoid shape until it flattens toward its distal navicular insertion. Um, 
it, can, it should also be evaluated in long axis. Here we course down the anteromedial ankle toward the navicular, and we see that the anterior tibialis maintains its same caliber of densely packed laminar appearing hyperechoic tendon fibers. Um, so any bulbous deformity or swelling in this or peritendinous fluid would suggest a, a tenosynovitis or a tendinosis. But this tendon looks rather uh, um, even uh, and normal in appearance. As with any long uh, uh, cylindrical tendon, it can be prone to rupture. Um, in this image, we see uh, in a panoramic view of the distal tibialis anterior tendon to the left intact over the tibia. But as we get to the ankle mortis, that tapers um, to just a wisp of, of a hypoechoic tendon in this image, likely indicating a full thickness disruption. <clears throat> Care must be taken to evaluate tibialis anterior all, all the way to its navicular insertion, um, which is onto the medial surface of the medial cuneiform um, and the base of the plantar first metatarsal. And uh, tendinosis can certainly be present here as well. Uh, manifested by um, a loss of normal laminar internal echo texture and a bulbous thickening uh, at the insertion. <clears throat> Moving laterally across the anterior ankle and the extensor compartment, the extensor hallucis longus lies between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum longus tendon at the anterior ankle. It has a relatively thin tendon uh, at the anterior ankle compared to the anterior tibialis. Um, and, and the extensor digitorum laterally. <clears throat> um, it, it maintains that distinct flattened ovoid structure as it courses over the dorsal medial foot. And then uh, as it does that, it, it too maintains a distinct um, laminar appearing hyperechoic tendon in, in long axis. Um, and, and that can be traced um, all the way distally to its first uh, toe distal phalanx insertion and dynamically assessed with great toe extension and flexion to show that its mechanism remains intact distally uh, when rupture might be con uh, con con uh, worried about. Moving uh, one more laterally in the extensor compartment in the anterior ankle, we get to the extensor digitorum longus tendon. It, it comprises the, it, its muscle comprises the bulk of the anterior lateral ankle um, uh, musculature. Uh, we see here the large muscular bulk of extensor digitorum longus here tapering um, to it, what becomes its four distinct flattened tendons at the anterior ankle joint. Um, this perhaps is a better image. Here we see it over the anterior ankle mortis. Oh, sorry. One more. Um, flattening to, to rather four distinct tendons that will each go to the second through fifth toes. And this is, this is shown just in a, in a still image. Um, we see the four, um, the, sorry, my asterisk is off, but we see four distinct hyperechoic tendons um, sitting over the anterior foot. Um, each, as with the extensor, how is this longest tendon? Each extensor digitorum tendon slip can, can be traced all the way to its distal phalanx insertion uh, and evaluated dynamically with uh, toe extension and flexion. Moving on to the neurologic structures of the anterior foot, the deep fibular nerve uh, courses through the anterior compartment of the leg and crosses over the anterior ankle joint and courses into the first web space. Uh, it, one prominent landmark that can be used to confirm the location of the deep fibular nerve is the anterior tibial artery, which lies in a deep position against the anterior tibia, shown here as a hypoechoic circular structure with a, with a lumen um, indicated by the pointer. It'll sit just lateral to the extensor hallucis longus tendon and muscle. Um, and often its, its anechoic appearance and pulsatility on Doppler will confirm its location. The deep perineal nerve will sit often superficial and medial to that dorsalis pedis artery, uh, indicated here by the star. And we'll follow that, that nerve's course here in a moment. Uh, turning on your color Doppler will, it will help you to confirm the location of the uh, dorsalis pedis artery, uh, if that's in question uh, or, or uncertain. As I said, the deep perineal nerve originates uh, and courses through the anterior compartment of the leg where it sits with your uh, 
vascular structures along the interosseous membranes. These ascend superficially through the anterior compartment on top of the tibia as those muscles in the anterior compartment taper their tendons. And so in this image, um, I'll, I'll try to point out where that deep perineal nerve is. Um, as that courses superficially, you'll want to decrease your depth so that you'll see that nerve better and more conspicuous. Here we continue to see that nerve medial to the vascular structures. And as you get to the anterior tibia, those will come to sit superficial and that nerve will certainly become more conspicuous as it does here coursing somewhat laterally but superficial to the dorsalis pedis artery. And we'll show that again. As it moves into the foot, um, the nerve will become superficial. I'll point it out here with my pointer. And it'll course uh, in between the first and second metatarsals into the first web space uh, as it traverses into the foot. And it can be prone to osteophytes um, from um, the tarsal metatarsal articulations um, and, and a bootstrap compression neuropathy at the anterior foot. The superficial perineal nerve uh, provides the sensation to the medial and intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerves of the foot. Um, uh, and that may split um, above or below the intermedial ankle joint. And so here in this image, we see the cartoon illustration of the superficial perineal nerve splitting into the medial dorsal cutaneous nerve of the foot and the lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve of the foot. Uh, the superficial perineal nerve courses through the lateral compartment of the leg, initially um, within and deep to perineus brevis. Uh, it then ascends in the lateral compartment to the, through an intramuscular septum between the lateral compartment of the leg and the anterior compartment of the leg uh, as it starts to do here. And as it does that, you'll want to move to a more superficial depth to follow that nerve as it courses up superficially as this uh, fascial compartment uh, can be prone to um, compression um, and neuroma formation uh, of the superficial perineal nerve as it courses superficially. As it moves into the foot uh, and the anterior ankle, it will divide into those medial and intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerves of the foot. And so setting your probe off and on the most superficial setting will help you to see this as that honeycombed appearing nerve divides into two distinct fascicles. And those fascicles can be followed into the foot. Here we see the medial dorsal cutaneous nerve of the foot um, as it jumps over into the anterior foot uh, to really innervate most of the dorsal foot um, intermediately except for that first web space. So it can be prone to compression, neuropathies, uh, and neuroma formation as well. Moving then posteriorly from that um, previous image, here we'll see the intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve of the foot and see that coursing more laterally as it innervates the dorsal uh, fourth and fifth rays of the foot. Moving down to the lateral ankle. The lateral ankle uh, can be evaluated with the patient in a lateral recumbent position uh, on the opposite side so that the ankle of interest will face upward toward the ceiling and, and be exposed. Its prominent structures are the fibularis or perineus tendons, the longus and brevis, the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, um, and the posterior talofibular ligament, which form the lateral ankle stabilizers. Uh, and then evaluating the posterior subtalar joint and the sural nerve. <clears throat> the perineus longus and, and brevis uh, course through the lateral compartment of the leg as they make their way to a shallow retromalleolar groove uh, on the lateral, uh, posterolateral fibula. Um, the fibularis longus becomes tendinous first and will be, sit more superficial, whereas the brevis will often have a much lower lying muscle belly almost to the superior perineal retinaculum, um, and its tendon will sit uh, adjacent to the posterior lateral fibula, as we see in this image. Uh, so the star indicating uh, the perineus longus here, perineus brevis is still mostly musculature, and its tendon is just starting to form as we get to the posterior lateral uh, uh, fibula. Um, as they get to the posterior lateral fibula, in the retromalleolar location. They're held in place by a superior perineal retinaculum. I'll try to indicate that here. In this image, uh, here we have perineus longus 
indicated by the star, perineus brevis against the bone, and that superficial perineal retinaculum or arching over the top of that. Uh, and those will hold those in place against the fibula. Uh, if that's disrupted, then perineal tendon uh, subluxation, a, a dislocation can occur, and I'll show an image of that in a moment. But as the, as the tendons course inferior from the lateral malleolus, they'll come to the calcaneus and arch over the calcaneofibular ligament. So here we see those tendons moving posteriorly. Here they're sitting superficial to the calcaneofibular ligament and the posterior subtalar joint to sit adjacent to the posterior lateral calcaneus. And in most people, many people, you have a more prominent bony uh, protrusion here, the perineal tubercle, which will provide um, uh, somewhat of a distinction between the more posterior perineus longus tendon and the anterior perineus brevis tendon. Perineus longus then continues to course around um, to the inferior cuboid. Um, and so here in this, this video, we see perineus longus start superficially here. It'll move to where that asterisk is, which indicates the cuboid. It then courses around cuboid, not inserting on the cuboid, but coursing around cuboid to the plantar foot, where it serves as a powerful foot um, everter. Uh, sorry, my slides got, I think they're out of order here. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get back to where I was. Here, I think this is it. Okay. Uh, moving back then to look more distinctly at the perineus brevis. As I said, it has a muscle belly that sits much lower than longus and will come almost to the superior perineal retinaculum. So here in this image, this video, we see perineus longus is already tapered and become tendinous. And most of this muscle bulk is then brevis. And that brevis muscle bulk will taper to move anteriorly to its tendon that sits against the fibula. And that's indicated here in this image where we see the perineus brevis tendon super, uh, 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 deep and anterior against the fibula and the perineus longus tendon sitting more posteriorly. An increase in fluid in this location is not uncommon in, in the presence of a, a tenosynovitis. Um, in this image, a hypoechoic or dark um, peritoninous uh, tenosynovitis is present, indicated by the stars. Um, the brevis has a, a much more flattened position in this image, likely indicated, indicative of some chronic tendinosis. Sorry. In this image, we have fibula anteriorly and the tendon sitting posteriorly. What we see here is a disruption of the superior perineal retinaculum so that that fibularis or perineus brevis tendon is actually able to sublux superficially and begins to perch up onto the uh, fibula uh, in an ankle uh, flexion and um, uh, inversion position. Moving on, as I said before, uh, and, and we'll talk to you again as we talked about the calcaneo, or the um, calcaneofibular ligament. The perineus longus and brevis tendons will serve as a good landmark, uh, both for the calcaneofibular ligament, but also the, the lateral posterior subtalar joint. Um, in, in this image, um, we see um, in short axis, those tendons go from um, distinct hypoechoic, or sorry, hyperechoic, um, relatively homogeneous appearing tendons to um, dark, uh, almost hypoechoic clefts um, within the tendon, likely indicative of some chronic tendinosis uh, in its mid-substance from chronic lateral ankle instability from, from repeated inversion events. And as we look down, we see the posterior subtalar joint, um, which has a bit of an effusion um, in this case, um, which occurred after a prominent ankle inversion sprain and injury. Perineus brevis, as it courses uh, beyond the um, lateral malleolus, will course down to insert into the base of, base of the fifth metatarsal. It becomes more flattened um, and widened 
as it takes its broad insertion into the perineus brev or into the um, base of the fifth metatarsal. And this image demonstrates that in long axis. And so we see its distinct tendon rising up superficial um, to have its broad insertion into the fifth metatarsal. Moving on then to the lateral ankle ligamentous um, stabilizers. Um, the three most prominent and visible structures are your posterior talofibular ligament, your calcaneofibular ligament, and your anterior talofibular ligament. The anterior talofibular ligament um, is the one most often injured. It's the most anterior structure that bridges from the anterior fibula over to talus. And it, it, it is relatively broad, about five millimeters. And so performing a, 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 a dorsal, uh, sorry, a, a dorsal plantar sweep of that will help to fully assess for pathology. Um, in this image, we see a full thickness disruption of the anterior talofibular ligament with no bridging fibers from fibula to talus uh, and a rather large uh, effusion um, distending the lateral joint recess. More chronically, you can see attrition of those anterior talofibular ligament fibers without disruption. And so in this image, we see um, what, what could be um, a, um, small bony avulsion, except that there's no there's no donor site. So it's unlikely that that's an avulsion, but rather um, a prominent uh, tendinosis at its origin. Um, and then mid-substance clefting and, and loss of echogenicity um, in the presence of, of chronic anterolateral ankle instability. The calcaneofibular ligament is the next ligament as you move posteriorly rotating around the inferior fibula. The landmarks for this, again, really the perineus longus and brevis tendons are going to help you hone in on this. And so as you scan those in short axis, you'll come down to calcaneus in that posterior subtalar joint. And as you get there, you'll see the hyperechoic laminar fibular appearing structure of the calcaneofibular ligament bridging across um, as we move forward to fibula. And this is a long ligament. Um, it's the longest of the three in the lateral ankle and it's long and cord-like. Its insertion is to the inferior and deep portion of the fibula. And so often this demands a, a gliding maneuver and a wagging of the transducer tail to really see those fibers. Um, this video shows that. We're seeing the calcaneofibular ligament from its origin coming over to fibula. And, and this is a scan um, almost plantar to dorsal to, to really capture um, the width of that ligamentous insertion into, into the inferior fibula. <clears throat> Moving then posteriorly, um, the, the most posterior, uh, some, uh, the most stout ligament in this complex is your posterior talofibular ligament. Um, it, it can be challenging to identify um, um, in, in patients uh, that are larger um, because of um, the challenging angle at which to see this. Uh, but in this image, we see it some somewhat rather distinctly bridging from uh, the talus posteriorly to the fibula anteriorly, indicated by, by the asterisks. Uh, as before, the posterior subtalar joint is seen deep to the calcaneofibular ligament. And in this image, a small effusion there helps to really make it uh, uh, more distinct and more visible. Um, it, it, in um, about 10 to 15, uh, about 10 to 20 percent of patients uh, will con connect to the ankle joint. Uh, and so um, an ankle pathology may cause distension in this joint. Um, and so it, be careful calling pathology here if, if coinciding ankle joint, tibiotalar ankle joint or, or um, fibulotalar ankle joint pathology might indicate why, why they have an effusion there. Another image showing an effusion. The sural nerve is the prominent neural structure in the lateral uh, uh, leg compartment. It, it forms from a contribution of the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve in the popliteal fossa that courses down uh, in, a, in a septum between the medial and lateral head gastrocnemius. In the ankle, it's identified um, lateral to your Achilles tendon. So the gastrocnemius contributions to the Achilles tendon will become a crescentic hyperechoic tendon in the posterior leg. And the sural nerve will course lateral to that. And so in that plane is where you should look for the honeycombed appearing 
sorry, moving backward, the honeycombed appearing sural nerve, and, and we'll see that here, um, as that nerve moves anterior um, to become the lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve of, of the foot. So here it is adjacent to Achilles tendon, moving anteriorly, and sitting posterior to your perineus brevis musculature. <laughs> At the foot, it becomes the uh, uh, lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve of the foot. It courses superficial to your perineus longus and brevis tendons. And we see that here going superficial to longus, and then here going superficial to brevis. And so a possible site of, of, of neuritis, perhaps if there's a perineal tendinosis or a tenosynovitis and inflammation. Moving on then to the posterior ankle, uh, there's fewer uh, anatomic structures in the posterior ankle, and, and these are more superficially distinct. Um, the Achilles tendon and its retrocalcaneal bursa and the retroachilles bursa and, and the plantaris tendon are the prominent structures. The Achilles tendon is the longest and thickest tendon in the body. It can be up to 12 to 15 centimeters in length and is comprised from contributions of the medial and lateral head gastrocnemius muscles uh, superficially and soleus. Um, distinctly, unlike most other tendons that course around structures or adjacent to structures and have a tenosynovium, this Achilles tendon does not, but rather it has what's called a peritenon, um, which we'll talk more about in a minute and contributes to pathology. As the Achilles tendon, uh, as the medial and lateral head gastrocnemius tendons uh, taper, they contribute to, they contribute to a crescentic uh, Achilles tendon in the posterior leg, and so it starts as a flattened, almost crescent, hyperechoic appearing structure, while soleus is still muscular. But soleus is inserting into Achilles as it descends through the leg, and we'll see soleus complete here. So soleus is completely inser inserted into the Achilles tendon. We don't see its muscle any longer, but rather a hyperechoic, densely packed Kager's fat pad. And that's seen here in this long axis image. So here we see the distinct fibular laminar appearing hyperechoic tendon of the gastrocnemius. We see the musculature of soleus tapering and inserting into Achilles tendon here. And then we see that soleus end right about here. And we're left with a densely packed hyperechoic tissue, which is Kager's fat pad. <laughs> which is intimately related to the deep Achilles tendon and can be implicated in pathologies by which neo vessels and neo nerves grow from that fat pad into the tendon and potentiate Achilles tendinosis uh, and pain. This is an image of, of a strikingly thickened Achilles tendon. Um, so if we move back in a previous image, we can see that the thickness of the Achilles tendon um, is really at, at most about you know six to eight millimeters. In this image, we see it approaches almost 15 millimeters. It's strikingly bulbous, and, and it lacks that well-defined laminar, even appearing fibular echo texture uh, of a normal tendon. So this is a, a severely pathologic Achilles tendon. As I spoke of before, um, Pathology in Achilles tendon can often involve ingrowth of neo vessels and neo nerves from the Kager's fat pad into the tendon and potentiate pain. And so, in that anatomic long axis view, turning on your color Doppler um, or superb microvascular imaging um, can identify vascularity growing in from the fat pad into the tendon. Uh, this is an unusual case, uh, but quite an interesting one. Um, there is tendinosis here, but quite distinctly, there's a large hypoechoic cystic appearing structure in the intrasubstance of the Achilles tendon. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I did not put in a cross-sectional view of this, but it appeared similar and distinctly intratendinous in short axis. Uh, and, and what this was was a... a, a, a delaminating split thickness tear of the intersubstance of the Achilles tendon that, that contained almost a serous fluid. 
um, but without a, without a full thickness tear. <clears throat> um, as, as before, speaking of Kager's fat pad, um, it, it, it is deep to the Achilles tendon at the posterior leg before um, the Achilles tendon goes to insert into calcaneus. And so as Achilles tendon inserts into calcaneus, it widens and it flattens. It also rotates, I keep skipping back. It also rotates some um, so that the uh, soleus contribution inserts to the posterior medial calcaneus and, and the gastrocnemius contributions insert more to the posterior lateral soleus. And so if we go back up again, oh goodness, um, we can see that tendon rotate as it begins to insert. The soleus fibers going medial and the Achilles, uh, the gastroc fibers going lateral. And what's important here is to see that that, that calcaneus has a very smooth, even appearing cortex as that tendon inserts. Um, if it doesn't, um, if, if there's punctate hyperechoic calcifications, I would suggest either an enthesial calcification or, or partial tearing. This is a, 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 a short axis view and contradistinction to the last video by which we saw a nice, even, densely packed Achilles tendon um, as a, a broomstick on end as tendon is likened to. In contradistinction, we're back to that severely tendinopathic Achilles tendon where it's strikingly thickened. This is almost 12 millimeters to 15 millimeters thick. There's large hypoechoic intratendinous clefting suggesting prominent tendinosis, and just an irregular bogginess uh, appearing Achilles tendon, indicative of that chronic severe tendinosis. <clears throat> um, in its insertion to calcaneus, the Achilles tendon has a broad insertion that spans over the course of about two to three centimeters. Um, it, its, its insertion into the calcaneus should be evenly and hyperechoic, when there are punctate hyperechoic calcifications, that can suggest tendinosis or tearing. Um, it's wide, and so it can be um, you know, 20, 25 millimeters wide, and so a medial lateral sweep of that Achilles tendon covering its full width is prudent to really definitively rule out um, tendinosis or presence of a Haglund deformity. And so in this image, we see pathology in a medial lateral sweep. We see in this still image, uh, a, a large um, uh, circular appearing, rounded appearing hyperechoic calcification at its emphasis. And we'll see more wispy calcifications as we move in our medial lateral sweep. Here, move that back. Here, uh, some wispy intratendinous calcification, suggesting more of a mid-substance tendinosis, um, and anthesial calcifications extending into the tendon, uh, as well as a bulbous thickening. So this is a, a chronic insertional uh, tendinosis process. More medially, that tendon appears less bulbous and, and more normal, and so that's where that full medial lateral sweep is prudent to really um, get a, a full characterization of the pathology and the, the breadth of the pathology in that tendon. <clears throat> the the retrocalcaneal bursa is a, uh, a bursa that lies between the posterior calcaneus uh, and Kager's fat pad and the Achilles tendon. And here we see it just minimally distended with fluid, enough to visualize that, but this can become rather largely distended with fluid and, and have a lot a notable increase in, in vascularity. And so turning on your color Doppler here is prudent. Um, the retro Achilles bursa is a potential space that lies between the Achilles tendon and the skin, um, and a gel standoff must be used to ensure that you don't compress this um, potential space. It's more commonly a contact or a friction um, bursitis, whereas the retrocalcaneal bursitis is more commonly associated with Achilles tendon pathologies. Uh, in this image, the Achilles tendon appears as a hypoechoic, um, even appearing structure. Um, 
in the center of the image, we see a densely hypoechoic uh, globular appearing structure indicating a full thickness disruption of the Achilles tendon with, a hyper, with an intervening hypoechoic hematoma forming. Assessing this dynamically, uh, in these images, we see that full thickness tear at rest. And at the center image, the ankle in dorsiflexion causes that the, the two ends of that full thickness tear to separate even further and that hematoma, that, that hypoechoic hematoma to enlarge. Moving on then to the smallest tendon, smallest structure in the posterior leg, the plantaris. It's a small, almost vestigial muscle and tendon in the posterior leg that courses between the medial head of gastrocnemius and its muscle and the soleus in the posterior leg. We see this soleus here as a small ovoid tissue uh, uh, moving between, uh, sorry, plantaris, moving between soleus and medial head gastrocnemius and moving up superficially. It continues to course superficial and medial as it moves through the leg to a position where it sits medial to the medial head gastrocnemius uh, Achilles tendon contribution. And as it ascends down the leg, it continues to have a distinct and independent tendinous appearing structure separate from the Achilles tendon as it courses into the medial leg. So if we move up just a bit, here we see medial gastrocnemius contribution to Achilles tendon, the tapering soleus, and we see a sural nerve here in its honeycombed appearance. As it courses into the leg to calcaneus, it, it can do one of a few things. It can insert directly into the Achilles tendon and blend into those fibers medially, um, or it can course medially independently and distinctly insert into the medial calcaneus, which it does in this case. So here we see tendon, as we advance the slide, we'll see that tendon here begin to dive toward calcaneus to here and have an independent insertion into calcaneus. This video shows that again as well. There's the tendon distinctly, distinctly coming down to insert into calcaneus. It's uncommonly pathologic. Um, it can sometimes be a confounder. Uh, in a patient with posterior medial leg pain and some ectomosis where gastroc is normal, Achilles tendon is normal. Um, in this case, um, there was a small degree of tendinosis. And so with proximal or cephalad being to the right, distal or uh, toward the Achilles, uh, toward the calcaneus to the left, we see a, smoke, a focal caliber change within that tendon uh, indicating some tendinosis. Moving then to the medial ankle, Its prominent, its prominent tendon structures um, are comprised of those in the tarsal tunnel, the posterior tibialis, the flexor digitorum longus, the flexor hallucis longus, uh, and then the tibial nerve and neurovasculature. The medial ankle ligamentous complex is largely comprised of the deltoid complex, which has um, two layers and, and three somewhat distinct ligaments. Um, the superficial and deep layers um, are hard to distinguish even sonographically, and, and so their description is somewhat academic, um, but each of those tibiotalar, tibiocalconeal, and tibionavicular contributions um, can be individually visualized uh, distinctly. More anteriorly and, and um, inferiorly, the spring ligament or the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament um, will also be clearly visualized bridging from the uh, sustentaculum tali to the, uh, to the navicular. <clears throat> um, the three contributions to the deltoid ligament largely are um, uh, the, the tibio navicular, tibio calcaneal, and tibio talar. Sitting most anteriorly is your uh, tibio navicular component, which bridges from the navicular tuberosity seen on the left to the anterior tibia. Um, it, it, is clearly visualized as a laminar hyperechoic fibular structure bridging from navicular to tibia. Um, keeping the probe anchored on the inferior medial malleolus 
and 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 performing almost a a fan like sweep posteriorly you'll come over you'll you'll fall off of navicular and come come to calcaneus and get to the tibial calcaneal contribution to the deltoid complex this sits deep to the posterior tibial tendon and so the the uh, septum that separates the posterior tibialis and uh, extensor digitorum um, longus uh, will often cast a hypoechoic shadow, a refraction shadow that can make the tibial calcaneal fibers less distinct. And so that's often when a, a sweep of this ligament um, will be helpful. But here we see that ligament indicated by the asterisks bridging from calcaneus to tibia. The tibial tailor is the longest and somewhat most distinct fibers. It again is seen um, by keeping that end of the, the transducer anchored on the inferior mal medial malleolus and rotating um, the inferior end posteriorly so that calcaneus falls off and we get to talus. <clears throat> um, this ligament originates off of originates off of the, the posterior tibia and into the tib, uh, Taylor tubercle. And, and so as you see this here, it's a, uh, that hypercoic fibular structure bridging across. Moving then um, inferiorly to the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament or the spring ligament, um, this is um, an important ligament in stabilizing the longitudinal arch of the foot. It bridges from calcaneus to navicular, as its name implies, um, not inserting on the talus, but rather supporting it uh, almost as, as a hammock uh, in, the, in the arch. Um, and so um, it's seen bridging from calcaneus to navicular. Um, it's often on the inferior port, uh, part of that articulation, and so, um, you can't keep your probe in a plane even with the plantar foot, but rather rotate plantarly and point upward almost toward the lateral malleolus will help you to visualize uh, that tendon, uh, sorry, that ligament distinctly bridging from calcaneus to navicular and, and um, bridging under talus. <clears throat> One important landmark for this um, as well is your posterior tibial tendon. So um, as we'll see when we show the uh, posterior tibial tendon in a moment, it courses directly over the sustentac adjacent to the sustentaculum tali, but directly over your spring ligament. Moving on then to the tarsal tunnel, um, it is a um, site in the lateral, uh, sorry, in the medial ankle, um, covered with uh, the medial retinaculum, um, and its components um, are the posterior tibialis tendon anteriorly the Fletcher digitorum longus tendon sitting next and its muscle, and then sitting posterior from that um, and adjacent to uh, the calcaneus and deep is your Fletcher hallucis longus muscle and tendon. Um, superficial to the Fletcher hallucis longus is going to be your posterior tibial artery and the tibial nerve. This site is important because of potential compression and what's called tarsal tunnel. Uh, which, which, as most um, compression neuropathy phenomena do, will, will affect the nerve. And so um, any kind of mass effect or prominent tenosynovitis within the tarsal tunnel can cause um, um, symptoms of numbness and paresthesias in a tibial distribution in the plantar foot. And so on the left of this image, we see a large tenosynovitis process involving the flexor hallucis longus tendon. And in the center, a large tibio-tailor ganglion cyst um, uh, causing a mass effect within the tarsal tunnel. The posterior tibialis is, is the largest tendon within the tarsal tunnel. Um, it can be almost twice as large as the uh, uh, flexor digitorum and flexor hallucis tendons. It should be densely hyperechoic and, and, and packed as almost like a broomstick on end. Uh, it maintains that large ovoid structure um, almost entirely to its distal insertion into the navicular. So any clefting in that um, or, or hypoechogenicity would suggest um, tendinosis or, or potential partial tearing, um, as it does in this image. So in the deep image, we see clefting, um, which might suggest some longitudinal or, or split thickness tearing 
of the posterior tibialis. As it courses into the tarsal tunnel, it, it moves from deep to superficial. Um, and so here we see that posterior tibialis sitting within the tarsal tunnel. Um, as it moves through the tarsal tunnel, it moves anteriorly um, with the flexor digitorum longus sitting just posterior to that. And so this demonstrates that back to those bony prominences as we discussed before. This is the sustentaculum tali, which is largely it's a good bony landmark to distinguish your flexor tendons um, and posterior tibialis in the medial foot. And so we'll speak more of that in a moment, but it, it distinctly separates your flexor digitorum longus and your flexor hallucis longus. Um, and posterior tibialis moves anterior. Again, that's important because it gets you over your spring ligament. And so as that posterior tibialis moves anteriorly, it's gonna sit over spring ligament before moving medially uh, and, and plantarly to the navicular <clears throat> tuberosity. And so here we see that posterior tib tendon moving into the plantar foot and inserting to the navicular tuberosity. We see it advance here. And as it begins to dive, it, it broadens and flattens to have a broad, flat insertion to navicular tuberosity. So be cautious calling tendinosis at its distal insertion here. And there it is, um, inserting to navicular. And it does this, as it, as it dives, as I said, it broadens and flattens somewhat normally. So to the right, we have um, the posterior tibialis tendon more proximally. It's going to broaden uh, and diverge as those slips um, insert into the navicular. And here we see that here, where the superficial fibers up here are still posterior tibialis, and it's inserting uh, e even deep here. <clears throat> and, and here the posterior tibialis really functions as a major, major stabilizer of the hind foot, um, so much so that, that when there's disruption of the posterior tibialis, um, it will result in loss of arch height and almost an acquired uh, flat foot. Flexor digitorum longus courses through the tarsal tunnel, posterior to the posterior tibialis tendon, and then distinctly sits adjacent to the sustentaculum tali. And we'll show that here. So posterior tibialis anteriorly, flexor digitorum longus here, and sustentaculum tali. It then moves into the plantar foot and traverses deep, as shown here. And so we'll rewind that just a bit to show the posterior tibia, or the flexor digitorum longus tendon here, it's gonna become anisotropic as it dives deep away from the transducer. And so it's important to wag your transducer to eliminate that anisotropy and distinguish that tendon as we do here. It's at this location in the medial foot that it actually has an intersection and at the master knot of Henry with the flexor hallucis longus. And we'll show its course here in a moment. But this is a potential site of, of, of tenosynovial irritation um, and pathology in the medial foot. Here, as we let that play, we'll see those tendons are differentially anisotropic. So flexor digitorum, flexor hallucis, flexor digitorum, flexor hallucis. Uh, and this image just indicates that in case it wasn't captured. The flexor digitorum is more superficial, flexor hallucis uh, longus more deep. And sitting just posterior to that is the lateral plantar nerve, um, uh, which, which um, sorry, the medial plantar nerve, um, which can be involved in a tenosynovitis process uh, and may develop some neuritis. Moving on then to the flexor hallucis longus. Um, it sits posterior to the sustentaculum tali, so that sustentaculum tali of the calcaneus is that hyperarchaic structure in the center of the image here flexor digitorum longus anteriorly, and flexor hallucis longus posteriorly, um, just below the level of the tarsal tunnel. And so we'll see that flexor hallucis longus tendon move deep. Here it has an intersection. It then courses up superficially, rather abruptly, to go down to the first ray to course down to insert into the, the plantar um, great toe. Um, advance. Okay, moving on then. Uh, this sweep is good in that it indicates the structures of the, the tarsal tunnel uh, in, in panorama. So here we are with the anterior 
um, tarsal tunnel, the posterior, uh, la uh, posterior medial tibia. Um, here we have the posterior tibialis tendon, the flexor deuterum longus tendon, and the vasculature. And as we course posteriorly then, we'll come across the tibial nerve. And so here's the tibial nerve sitting superficial for the flexor hallucis longus muscular bulk. So this is all largely muscular bulk of the flexor hallucis longus, your dorsalis pedis artery, <clears throat> sorry, um, your posterior tibial artery, its accompanying vessels, and then the honeycombed appearing, the honeycombed appearing tibial nerve proper. So it's whole here. It hasn't split into its medial and lateral plantar nerves yet. <clears throat> but it will here. And so, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I like to bring your attention to the, the, the anatomic dissection here um, on the left. Um, it, it demonstrates the divisions of the tibial nerve as it moves into the medial foot. And so most proximal here at the, at the rectangle would be the tibial nerve proper when it's whole um, within the tarsal tunnel. <clears throat> and so the, the, the uh, calcaneal division <clears throat> will often separate first. And it can separate from the tibial nerve proper. It can happen above the level of the uh, medial retinaculum and tarsal tunnel, or, or it can do it afterward. Um, but so scanning the tibial nerve up in, into the leg, looking for that fascicle to split off, um, imperative in finding the calcaneal division. Um, it, it, it's also been described as branching off of the lateral plantar nerve or, or being less distinct uh, from the lateral plantar nerve um, uh, in the foot as well. But in this image, we see the, the tibial nerve uh, proper. And, and where the calcaneal division is, it's going to be the first fascicle that comes off posteriorly. And so as we follow this cine loop, we'll see that calcaneal division come off here. And it courses immediately posteriorly to come to sit adjacent to the medial calcaneus. So again, we'll follow that cine loop. It pops off as the tibial nerve moves anteriorly, and that fascicle courses abruptly posteriorly to the calcaneus. And so your transducer movement can't be even um, in, 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 at the malleolus as if you're going to the plantar foot, but it must be posteriorly to really um, pick that out. <clears throat> and this video just shows that again, uh, that calcaneal division coming all the way over to the posterior talus to in, uh, give cutaneous sensation. Um, moving then uh, anteriorly um, to the tibial nerve again, after the tarsal tunnel here, it will split to your medial plantar nerve and your lateral plantar nerve, your medial plantar nerve moving anteriorly and deep, and your lateral plantar nerve um, moving posteriorly. And so, moving it forward, we need to move backward. Here we go again. <clears throat> here that division. So I'm going to rewind that. Here we see the tibial nerve um, almost whole. It's starting to divide and looking a bit broad. But then as we advance that, we'll see those two fascicles of the medial plantar nerve and the lateral plantar nerve distinguish themselves. The medial moving anteriorly, the lateral moving posteriorly. And you can see here that those, those distinguish themselves rather well. So here again, the medial plantar nerve, the lateral plantar nerve moving posteriorly. The lateral plantar nerve will course deep um, to the plantar foot. It gives off a fascicle called Baxter's nerve or the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, which goes over to um, near the plantar fascia. And it's important because it can be a mimicker of, of plantar fasciitis. And so picking out and identifying that lateral plantar nerve contribution will help you uh, find that Baxter's nerve. And we'll see that here. So I'll rewind it to the start here and orient you. Here we see the lateral plantar nerve and the medial plantar nerve. And almost immediately after these separate, we're going to see a fascicle move posteriorly off of that. I'll pause that again. Here we have the lateral plantar nerve proper. And as we course inferiorly and posteriorly, we see a distinct fascicle come off of that which is Baxter's nerve. I'll rewind that just a little bit. We'll see it almost whole here. And then that Baxter's nerve here, or the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, move posteriorly. So we'll run that 
and see that Baxter's nerve, of course, inferiorly. I believe the next slide gets it coursing over to the plantar fascia. But here we see that that fascicle break off from the lateral plantar nerve proper. And here we'll see that nerve here distinctly dive down near the, the central band uh, plantar fascia. And that's what I had, um, kind of a whirlwind. Um, I hope uh, we did as good as we can um, instructing ultrasound remotely. Um, but I think um, we might have a couple, I I've got time um, if there's any questions or if anyone in the audience had anything. Um, Jim, do you know, is, was there any comments? Um, oh, there's a chat, sorry. Yeah, uh, you know, Daniel, this is just a very amazing lecture. This is. <laughs> I really like it. It, uh, it highlights all the dynamic imaging that uh, some of us have difficulty trying to uh, scan, especially with the ankle and foot, and you just uh, make it appear very easy for everyone. <laughs> so uh, this is really an amazing lecture and uh, I really appreciate you for making this uh, uh, one great lecture for everyone. So anyway, uh, I just would like to, uh, Ask if there's any comment or any question from anybody, or you're just astounded by the <laughs> lecture of Dr. Daniel. <laughs> I'm so amazed, Daniel. It's really nice. Yeah. My pleasure. Uh, there's a question here. I, I'll read it for you. I'd like to ask for your tips on patient positioning for the different ankle scans. So, yeah, certainly. I mean, in ultrasound, you know, a good part of the battle is, is ergonomics and positioning yourself to see what you need to see, to see what you want to see. Um, I didn't go into injections, uh, and that's a whole other um, topic about positioning for injections. But for the most part, um, I'll, I'll have the patient supine, uh, have the patient laying for their comfort, uh, particularly if it's a prolonged evaluation. And then for the foot and ankle, if you're going to do multiple regions, you're going to need to rotate them. But for the anterior ankle, um, it's usually best to have them supine on their back and the calcaneus just off the end of the bed, which helps to drop the foot into a bit of plantar flexion and almost open up that anterior ankle. If the calcaneus is on the bed, it puts it almost in a neutral ankle, um, which, which can be more challenging. For, for the medial ankle, um, I'll often have them almost just roll onto their right side or, or to their side of interest just a little bit and externally rotate the hip, which then puts the medial ankle uh, upward, upward toward the ceiling and exposes that. Um, for the lateral ankle, a lateral recumbent position on the opposite side is useful to bring those structures upward toward the ceiling that you can access. And then for, for the posterior, um, positioning the patient in a prone position um, on their stomach so that the posterior ankle is facing upward toward the ceiling, exposes what you need to see there. Okay, does it answer your question, Jeremy? Do you have any ad additional question? I think uh, this is uh, just uh, a complete lecture of the ankle and foot. And so uh, you just uh, basically cover everything, everything in the foot that uh, everybody needs to cover. And I think it's fully covered. So we really appreciate you, Daniel, for making such a presentation and uh, they are asking if they can have the PDF uh, <laughs> part of your lecture, but I, I told them uh, since yeah. we have a since we have a YouTube uh, channel, you can go and subscribe there because the lecture today will be posted there tomorrow, oh, and uh, you can subscribe so you can see everything in that uh, in that channel. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think it's it's a it's um. I don't think a PDF necessarily would do it justice given the, the dynamic, uh, the number of videos in that. And then um, it, it's a quite large file overall. So um, right. having it on YouTube and recorded there is, um, I mean, I'm, I uh, consent to that and, and that's excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel, yeah. for allowing us to, to post this and view this uh, so everybody could actually review them. And so uh, again, Daniel, I really appreciate
appreciate you. It's late in the night. It's about maybe 10 in your in your country, right? In your place. Is it, is it 10 o'clock in the evening? Yes, it is. And so yes. we really appreciate you. And hopefully we can still have another meeting with some other structures that uh, you might want to share with us in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> so we are yeah. all locked down and uh, I know this is the only way. This is the only way we can actually uh, learn through Zoom yeah. because uh, we're faced with so much... Uh, restrictions right now yeah so yeah, i think you know you're making le making lemonade out of lemons here uh, but you know certainly uh, thank you for the invitation here um yeah. it's a pleasure yeah thank you very much too and uh any more question dr jim may we just be allowed to thank dr daniel thank you dr daniel i mean in behalf of everybody here it's our first time to actually see you from the philippines some of us and we're very grateful because it was such an extensive and a very beautiful presentation thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. So any more comments, any more questions? So just uh, go to the Mask Ultrasound YouTube to see all the lectures and you can review them in, uh, at your own convenient pace and time. So thank you. And uh, again, Dr. Daniel, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to see you. Thank you also for your contribution in the chapter, in the book. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Well, everyone. And and take care and God bless you. Yeah. Thanks. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank See you yeah. tomorrow. See you tomorrow, 3 o'clock p.m. 3 o'clock p.m. Philippine time for our next lecturer, Dr. Khalil, Adam Khalil. Okay. See you and God bless. God bless.